Well, hey there, welcome back. Today we are continuing in the book of Hebrews. Today we're picking up in chapter 12. Um, now you probably noticed if you've been following along in this series that we skipped chapter 11. And this is because I actually have a six week Bible study that is geared completely towards Hebrews chapter 11. So my plan at some point eventually is to make a whole nother Bible study series on chapter 11 to go with that Bible study. So if you are here and you're wondering if the series is yet available, go ahead and check the description below. I will make sure that I put a link to the Bible study guide to um, Hebrews 11 so you can go check that out. But um, also, depending on when you're watching this video, maybe I've already made this series. So go check the description, see what I have available for you down there. But today we are going to go into chapter 12. So at the end of chapter 10, going into chapter 11, we'll do a little bit of review here first before we get into it. So we saw um, the author give his readers some exhortation at the end of chapter 10, and he told them that you guys just need perseverance. You need endurance. And then that's why he went into the faith chapter was to give them this cloud of witnesses, as we'll see when we get into chapter 12. But he wanted to show them all of these people who have gone before them, just having the hope that the promises, hope in the promises that God had given them. Many of them never saw the fulfillment of the promise that God had given them, but they persevered in faith. So that's why the author of Hebrews shared all of the stories that he did of these great men and women of old who displayed great faith. It's because he wanted to teach them what it means to have hope as an anchor of our soul, that placing faith in Christ and the work that he has done on the cross is enough to save us. We don't need the continued animal sacrifices, which is what these believers were being tempted to go back to. They were Christians, but they were being tempted to go back to the old Jewish customs of animal sacrifice. And the author, all the way through the book of Hebrews up to this point, is showing them that no, Jesus is better. You don't need to continue with the sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice was the final sacrifice. With it, he inaugurated a new covenant that is not based on the law. It is based on the grace and the mercy of God. It is by grace through faith that we are saved. So Hebrews 11 was just a chronicle of men and women of old who proved their faith through endurance. And these faithful servants bear witness to these believers at this time, but also continue to bear witness to us what it means to press on in faith. And you and I, we have received the substance of what they were looking forward to. We have received Christ. The mystery of God's eternal plan for salvation has been revealed in Christ. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into chapter 12. Before we do, um, we must remember, again, I've said it before, but let's just let's go over it again. We must remember that Hebrews was written to people who were being persecuted. Right? So they had walked away from Judaism, from the law, right? All the customs, all the traditions of the law. And they were facing very bitter opposition. So there was a danger that they may interpret their sufferings as a sign of God's displeasure. They may become discouraged and just give up. Or even worse, they may be tempted to return to the temple and to its ceremonies, right? So the author wanted them to understand that trial and persecution do not always indicate displeasure from God. And also, again, we learned back in Hebrews 10 verse 36 that the Hebrews were in need of endurance, right? So the author is about to explain how God can use their trials and their persecutions that they're facing to produce a harvest of endurance in their faith. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the throne of God. Okay, so the author is saying, all right, I have just shown you in chapter 11 all these examples of faithful servants of God who endured in their faith. Now it's your turn, right? So, and the author actually gives them a formula for how they, how we can endure through trials. 
says, remember the faithful witnesses. We have so great a cloud of witnesses. Lay aside, get rid of every obstacle and sin that entangles you. Run with endurance the race that is set before you. And then look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. So while not naming any one specific sin, the author may have been referring to the sin of unbelief. Okay, we've seen that theme of unbelief pop up a couple times in the book of Hebrews as a whole, right? So unbelief had kept Israel out of the promised land and unbelief keeps us from entering into our spiritual inheritance in Christ, right? So the phrase by faith or through faith is used 21 times in chapter 11. So this shows us that faith in Christ is what enables us to endure. So we see we're to lay aside every encumbrance and sin. So sin can hold us back. However, there may be things that aren't necessarily sin, but are merely hindrances or encumbrances, things that keep us from running effectively the race that God has set for us. So for an example, I think one of the biggest hindrances for me in encumbrance right? A hindrance isn't necessarily a sin, but it's something that can keep me from pursuing God with all of my heart and all my soul and all my mind. Um, and it's busyness. So making my schedule so full that I don't have any margin whatsoever. And then when I don't have that margin, it's really hard for me to put first his kingdom, right? I put my kingdom before his, my schedule, my to-do list. So that's just one example of something that's not necessarily a sin, but something that can hold us back from pursuing, from pursuing God and running our race with endurance. This word here for fixing just means to look away from everything else. So the author makes it pretty clear here that we need to rid ourselves of these things, right? So not all the choices that we make are black and white, good or bad, right or wrong. Sometimes, with the help of the indwelling spirit, we need to judge and discern what things are holding us back from running towards the Lord. So that would be a question I would pose for you today. So what in your life is a hindrance? Something that's not necessarily a sin, but something that may be keeping you back from pursuing the Lord. So I would just ask you to, or I would encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to just reveal, reveal those things in your life. Anything that may be hindering you from running your race anything holding you back from pursuing the Lord with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength? Are you willing to lay that thing aside? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Okay, so let's keep going. We're going to pick it up in verse three and we're going to go all the way through verse 11. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers. You are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Okay, so the writer wants his readers to know that suffering is not a sign of God's rejection. So God's grand design for redemption included the suffering of his son, the suffering of Jesus. So Jesus gives us the ultimate example of what it means to endure through suffering, right? Sometimes we do experience suffering because of our own sin and bad choice and bad choices, right? It's a consequence. But other times, like in the example that we see in Jesus, it's because of obedient and righteous living. 
So God's word tells us that those who want to live for Jesus are going to suffer persecution. But the beautiful reality for a child of God is that God can use all of our suffering, self-inflicted or not, for our good, right? So suffering can be a tool when we surrender it to God. He can use the difficulty and the trials that we go through to shape our lives and to mold us further into the image of Christ. And God has not changed. This promise is still applicable for us today. God will not abandon us in the midst of hard times. And he will use the struggle to perfect our faith in Christ, even though I know it's, it can be hard to believe that sometimes, especially when we're in the midst of the messy, right? When they're standing in the midst of the trial, it can be hard to see how God is going to use it for our good. But that is his promise that we can stand on, that one day we will be able to look back and we'll be able to see. It may not be here on earth in this lifetime. It may be once we are in heaven with him and we're able to see all things fully and clearly, we'll be able to look back and like, oh, okay, I see why now. So as children of God, we should never view the discipline of God as a sign of his rejection, right? So instead, we need to think of it as God treating us as sons and daughters. It's a sign that we are loved by him. Okay, so let's keep going. 12 through 17. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears." So our eternal inheritance includes life in God's kingdom and an intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father, right? We have been given this birthright. So the author has given exhaustive reasons to be strong in the Lord and to put off discouragement, right? So the picture in these verses is strengthen the hands and the knees, make straight paths for your feet. All of these speak of readiness to work and to move for Jesus and his kingdom. So he's saying that it's time to put off the things that hinder us and start moving, start working, start living in the kingdom of God. As God's children, we have a role to play in his kingdom, right? God wants to partner with us through the indwelling spirit to produce his kingdom fruit and to bring his kingdom and his will on earth as it is in heaven. So many Christians today sell this birthright, this inheritance of intimacy with God as cheaply as Esau sold his birthright. So God's grace does not fail, but we can fail to depend on God's grace. So Esau, the story of Esau, he warns us not to live for the things of this world, but rather to focus on the things that will produce eternal value. Okay, so verse 18, the author is going to begin this section with the word for, Right? So he's connecting what he is about to say with what he had just said in the previous section. Okay, so verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and to the sound of words, which sound was such that so who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight. That Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and to the assembly, the general assembly, and to the church of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So here we see the author goes on to compare two different mountains, right? So the first mountain represented the old covenant, the law. And then the second illustrates the new covenant of grace in Christ. The blood of Abel refers to the blood of the sacrifice that he made. Abel made the first recorded sacrifice from man to God. One commentator says it this way, and I love this picture. It says, the blood of Abel cried, justice must be satisfied, bring vengeance. The blood of Jesus cried, 
justice has been satisfied. Bring mercy. We have access to the very throne room of God. We have access to the grace and the strength of God through Jesus who invites us to come and enjoy his presence, to come and drink of the waters of eternal life, to enjoy the love and the peace and the comfort and the strength and the joy that we have access to now as children of his kingdom. Verse 25, see to it that you do see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven? So as we've seen, kind of sprinkled throughout the whole book of Hebrews, that God has and is continuing to speak through his son, through Jesus. And we must not refuse to hear him, to listen to what he is saying in Jesus. So those who disobeyed the voice of God as it was heard in the law were punished accordingly. So in Christ, God has given his best and final revelation. God's plan to redeem mankind through Christ was set from all eternity. So let's read the last few verses here. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he is promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of the things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So what an amazing promise for us to cling to, right? And a great reminder to set our focus and attention on eternal things. So the created things of this world that we so often hold so near and so dear, they're going to one day pass away. God and his kingdom will remain. We have an inheritance from the Father. One day, very soon, we will behold the fullness of his glory and receive the fullness of our salvation. And again, you've heard me say this before, we must remember that eternal life with God starts now. It's not something we have to wait for. Eternal life in God's kingdom as his children begins now. It's because we have been given access in Christ through the Spirit to his presence. That veil has been torn. The work has been done. We belong to an eternal kingdom, one that will never spoil, one that will never fade. Earthly kingdoms are going to rise and fall, right? They are shaken and overtaken. God's kingdom will remain. And that's all for today. In the next video, we're going to finish up our series of Hebrews. We're going to come back with Hebrews 13. We're going to finish up this book. So if you have not yet subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. Also, make sure you come and check out the Girls in the Word Facebook group where we study and discuss God's Word together. I'll also leave a link in the description below where you can find us. And thank you so much for watching.